Hi, my, my name is Min Zhou. I'm from Altair Engineering. Uh, I've been with Altair for 23 years now. So I joined Altair after I finished the PhD and finished habitation in Germany. And uh, they, at the time, Altair started to develop this uh, topology optimizing software called OptiSuct. So I, I came to California, so in the Los Angeles area, and I joined the team. At the time, we had only four developers, and uh, and uh, today we have uh, um, uh, around probably 35 developers, people uh, working on OptiSwift. So it has been quite a, a ride, quite a journey that uh, that is uh, very successful. I would say OptiSwift today is the leading structure optimization software in the world. And I will cover the first part that is, a, I want to introduce some optimization theory and, uh, and uh, also application aspects. And Tom Goodwin, my colleague from UK, he will cover some more practical aspects about how you can uh, use or how we emphasize the, the side of uh, usability so that engineers ha don't have to deal with uh, um, uh, more uh, complex uh, theoretical uh, uh, part of how you formulate a problem. Instead, uh, we should create a solution that's intuitive to use. So I also wear another hat. So um, at, at here, I'm a technologist and uh, I actually I have kept uh, active uh, profile within the research community uh, throughout my career and uh, you can find me on google uh, uh, scorner with my citation profile i have uh, over 5000 sites to my papers to date and uh, actually last year i took over the leading journal that's a springer structural and multidisciplinary optimization as editor-in-chief uh, and also i I serve on um, the executive uh, committee of the uh, international community uh, uh, com community uh, of uh, this research field as uh, I serve on the committee as uh, vice president. And uh, uh, to start with, I just want to frame the, the background. So basically in the last uh, 20 plus years, we have been promoting the uh, concept of, of simulation driven design and uh, so I want to briefly capture where we are with that uh, technology trend. So basically we know that uh, design has become digital. You build your product with CAD on your computer and then you simulate the physics. That's the progress in the last 30 years. Uh, simulation like here is a, some example of, uh, of Crash simulation and uh, simulation can quite accurately predict physical uh, behavior. So basically, it largely replaces the uh, physical test. Uh, in this way, you actually accelerate the development process because everything is done digital. You uh, build the product digitally and then you test it um, uh, virtually that allows you to do many, many more iterations to improve your product. At, at and also at the same time shorten the uh, uh, development uh, time. And uh, for the technology to be viable, um, HPC, so high performance computing, is definitely an important enabler uh, of uh, the process. And uh, another turning point is when optimization starts to drive the design from the very beginning, that's uh, when topology optimization was applied. So we were promoting this, but then I think the uh, inflation point was when uh, Airbus applied topology optimization on the design of A380. So at the time, they had a lot of pressure to, to cut weight. Uh, you know, when uh, aircraft program is being um, started, then they promise a certain weight target to their customers, to the airliners. So usually the, at the end, you are always under pressure to, to, to cut weight because it come out usually overweight. 
So, so during that process, applied topology optimization on uh, one, that's one example published. So um, the leading edge ribs, uh, the Zuplos ribs of uh, uh, a group of uh, ribs of, uh, uh, I think like 26 ribs uh, on the both sides. And it uh, reduced it reduced the like over 40% weight. So that was a tremendous eye-catching success. And uh, at the time, uh, Boeing was in the middle of developing the Dreamliner, the 787 uh, full composite aircraft. And they they read the, uh, the success story from Airbus, so they started to push heavily um, uh, applying optimization uh, not just topology, also size and shape, uh, of course, uh, in the on the program. So, so they built a 787 optimization center uh, in uh, Seattle at their uh, design center, and uh, they had uh, hundreds of engineers working at the um, optimization center with uh, probably around 100 at the peak phase, around 100 from at air supporting their activity. And not only they, 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 they did the optimization work in-house, also they mandated their suppliers uh, uh, to use OptiSoft. Uh, so, so I visited some of their suppliers, they said Boeing told us we must use it. So that was the story. So that was a great success and all this, you know, aircraft is iconic, people follow it. So, so that really helped to, to, to make uh, optimization technology and uh, not more popular from that point. So if we, now I, I want to wear my uh, academic hat and just try to introduce the, the methodology a little bit. So when did topology optimization start? Uh, so before that we have shape and size and, and but I think topology optimization changed the game uh, in many ways because it caught the imagination of engineers and now you can create a design out of thin air, and that is fascinating from an engineering uh, imagination perspective, right? So that's why it caught attention. So the uh, formulation, the theory started uh, not long time ago. It's around 1990. So actually, the most popular method is the so-called SIMP method is uh, uh, sonic isotopic material with penalty. And uh, that was first introduced by uh, Benzo and, and me and my then PhD advisor, uh, Roswani. So we were mostly credited as the founder of this method. So the method is very simple actually. Uh, so very intuitive. So in, in, say if you deal with the design domain discretized in finite element, like this simple example, you have force, you have elements. So what do you want to define in terms of topology? Basically, if you look at each element, you can say, I want to define the material as two, at two states. One is as void, if density is zero, and another is at one, which means whatever material it is, so aluminum, then it's full uh, aluminum, and, uh, and uh, uh, then zero is, is, uh, is void. And uh, so that the original problem is the integer programming problem. But dealing with the discrete variable optimization, it's uh, tremendously difficult and time consuming. So, so we uh, turned this into a continuous variable problem. We say, okay, we let the density vary between zero and one, but we don't want the result to end in the middle because if you have a semi-density, what does it mean? So it's neither air or aluminum what it what it is so we don't want that result so we introduce a very simple concept which we which make we use a penalty to make the intermediate density less attractive so if you use a power law to scale the stiffness uh, so you can imagine when you have density at uh, zero the power of let's say power of two it's still zero and at one, the power of two is still one. So it doesn't change the physical state of the desired uh, uh, outcome. But in the middle, so if you have a density of 0 0.5, uh, power two, it, it becomes 0 0.25. So it's only half 
uh, effective as the price you pay at, at half density. So that way, the optimizer will understand that it's not very useful. So it will try to push the design towards zero or one. So that's the effect of this penalty. Now you see, we when we optimize it, then we get a, a discrete topology layout. So that's that's a density method which is is quite simple and uh, straightforward. And and this is. Uh, Today, the most popular methods uh, in software in implementation as well as uh, in research. And uh, uh, like after uh, the turn of the millennium, in the beginning of the 2000, um, uh, Michael Wang and uh, Gregor Nair, they introduced uh, another very interesting approach called the level set method. So with this method, so how they they would define the geometry as a, a level set of a higher dimension function. It's called level set function. So you can imagine that you have this 3D by 2D problem. You have this 3D level set function, and the slice throughout the zero level set is your topology as shown in the bottom. So by varying the level set function, uh, then you define the topology from a boundary evolution perspective. So, so this is uh, conceptually very or mathematically very fascinating. The way how you define the problem practically, there is uh, attractive property that now you transition the design always in a solid and void state from a boundary um, formation instead of uh, from a pixel definition of the of the density, let me come back. So that that is the interesting method. It became also quite popular in research, and uh, numerical implementation. It's not quite straightforward because now how you drive the boundary change. So they develop uh, the initially it's uh, it's with the Hamilton Jacobi equation formulate the evolution of the boundary, and then you would have to. Uh, derive a uh, so-called velocity field. Basically, the, the speed, how you change the, the boundary and applying that into a general uh, engineering problem with many constraints and so on, it's not straightforward. So this method has not been implemented, implemented much in software. Also, obstructed, we took a uh, um, First step to implement the level set method uh, probably about 10 years ago. Uh, it didn't work out um, perfectly, and uh, and we put it on, on ice for a while. Recently, we revived it. We improved the method, so now it became more usable inside Object. We do have a level set uh, implementation within a general framework, which is not an easy thing to do. Most of the research papers they they basically deal with a highly simplified problem like minimizing compliance with a volume target. And uh, uh, just to give a little bit of detail, how do you describe the level set function? Uh, so you can uh, define it as a so called sign distance function to define the, the uh, level set boundary, and then the level set function itself. Here is an example you can use RBF function. Uh, at uh, every discrete point, uh, and then you can use the basically the, the sum of the RBF to define the, the contour of the uh, level set function, and then you define the uh, level set at, cert at a certain threshold to be the level set cut. And then how you map that into your finite element, you can map it down to um, uh, a fixed mesh, that's typically what people do, or some researchers use the conformal mesh, which is uh, then you have to adapt your mesh uh, iteratively. And uh, just to mention another quite exciting new idea that's more uh, newer, I would say, in more recent years, uh, some researcher introduced uh, 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 the concept of so-called moving and movable component. So, so what they say, okay, is uh, why do we define the uh, 
topology in, in the way that you deal with so many variables. How about if we define it as a compilation of components? You can think in that this design domain, you have many components. You let these components uh, float and move, and then your shape, your topology, and also the components can change their size. So it's called moving, and, but also morphable components. So, so how do you implement that? Basically, these components are like a zone of projection. So it has similarity to neighbor set in a way. You have a geometry boundary, and then that geometry feature would project onto a background mesh. So that's how you realize that. And then, uh, then you derive the sensitivity of the uh, motion and sizing of the components uh, based on their projection onto the mesh to drive the optimization process. So uh, here is a 3D implementation of, of their approach, like they, they, it's a Michel uh, problem, uh, that Michel trust problem with a torsional uh, load, you form a, a sphere of uh, uh, hanky nets, like orthogonal nets on the surface, sphere surface for the torsional load. And uh, uh, now in this problem, they showed that you 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 reduce that to to far fewer variables. In, instead of dealing with millions of variables to get a good resolution solution, you can use just hundreds of uh, uh, components with thousands of variables. You can get a solution that is quite close to the to the Michel uh, torsion sphere. sphere. Um, and uh, there are some other methods. So. There was a branch uh, started actually the first with uh, with Benzo is based on homogenization approach and uh, uh, then uh, you have the so-called evolutionary structure optimization which uses criteria driven uh, process uh, like say you take away uh, material where stress is no and then uh, that that way you change the topology so. Um, that is more heuristic and probably not quite easy to fit into a general engineering optimization problem, but that method has also been evolving and, and converging in many ways towards uh, uh, mathematical approach like SIMP. And uh, uh, there is other approaches like, for example, graph-based uh, heuristics uh, dealing with crash node, which is very complex and difficult to to deal with, and then there's the equivalent static load method when you deal with crash uh, that had some uh, success, but still uh, far from mature. And uh, if you want to study topology optimization, you can find these uh, uh, review papers. That would be a good uh, uh, way to, to start getting an overview about topology optimization. And uh, I want to also mention that in the journal, in the SMO journal uh, that I, I, I now um, need as editor-in-chief, uh, we had published many educational papers. So these papers are very interesting. They mostly they contain a very compact MATLAB code that you can play with and you can manipulate. And uh, just very recently, uh, I was a co-author. We wrote a paper with uh, uh, Xianli Zhang's group from University of uh, uh, Illinois, and uh, and uh, her students, and also together with uh, um, Ola Sigma, we wrote a review paper on educational articles. As you can see, that the number of educational articles had gone up quite significantly, which uh, really helps to grow the research community that makes it easy for PhD students to get their hands on different type of problems and learn and then build their, their own code on that basis. And also this type of paper has been very highly cited. So it's a very successful category of paper uh, papers. And so this paper, it's going to be published probably in the next week or so. So if you are interested in studying topology optimization, that's uh, great starting point to, to take an overview of the available uh, MATLAB codes and, and the educational content 
around this field. I just want to mention that this genre, this category of paper was more or less pioneered by Warner Sigmund, and he published a, a, a paper with the 1999 topology organizing code uh, uh, in like 20 years ago. So this paper is, you see, how much cited, cited over a thousand times, downloaded over uh, 13,000 times. Uh, probably more, I, they have a university, popular university website. It would be downloaded probably way more than that, um, his site. And uh, uh, I used this code to teach a class. So, and then I noticed that there are gaps in the theoretical part because it focused on code, so it didn't cover all the steps in the optimization algorithm. So recently I, I took the initiative to, to co-author a paper with Ola Sigmund uh, to add complementary notes to close all the theoretical parts uh, that's uh, that's not detailed. So that would make it much easier for students to learn. So would be a good starting point to play with this code and uh, and also uh, you can you can find uh, all the theoretical details contained in the recent uh, complementary uh, lecture notes. And uh, I can just show briefly how such a code look like. So here is the uh, 88 num version they, they developed then later uh, uh, um, on the basis of the 99 version like optimized the um, uh, loops with vectorization and uh, and uh, and then it became more efficient. So so you can see this is a code and uh, let me see if I can enlarge it a little bit. So um, as you can see that it's just it's that short. It's 889 uh, lines containing the entire process of. Uh, uh, this uh, element stiffness matrix, then how you uh, shape the global stiffness matrix with with some uh, very efficient uh, MATLAB functions and build the stiffness uh, matrix, and then you can define your force and uh, and uh, uh, zero your displacement vector, and then then you build the the, the preprocessing, and then you start the loop uh, to um, control. Uh, the stiffness metrics with your density variables, and and then then your your uh, build sensitivity analysis, the 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 structural analysis itself, and the MATLAB. I, actually, by playing with this, I learned MATLAB. I didn't know MATLAB before, and it's so easy to build solutions. Like here with one line, basically that's how you solve your analysis equation. So displacement in sparse form. Well, everything is in sparse form and uh, is equal to k stiffness backslash f. You solve this entire linear equation that way. So it's a very easy way to, to construct a solution in MATLAB. And uh, I can run this code, as you can see. You can also change the boundary if you want to run different problem. Like here, we define a rectangular design domain with uh, uh, 60 elements. Three by one, sixty elements on the x direction, uh, twenty elements in the y direction, and set a few parameters like what's the member size, what's the uh, 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 penalty, and then you can run this problem. And now you can play with it, and and you'll see results uh, right away. And uh, so so this kind of uh, Educational content with compact MATLAB code really uh, helps to uh, help students to learn or uh, like uh, researchers, uh, to, uh, new researchers to, to get familiar with uh, with methods by really playing with it and, and also ma manipulate the code. And also now it covers many different. Uh, uh, more difficult problems like stress constraints are code dealing with stress constraints, there, there's code dealing with buffering constraints and so on. So that's a great way to to start the solution is done. Uh, to start learning um, topology optimization. And uh, now let me switch the gear towards uh, um, 
Do you still see my screen, right? Yeah. Towards how, what's the difference between a commercial solution compared to a educational content? Uh, so uh, now in order to deal with real engineering problems, we have to deal with the general uh, optimization problem. So basically you now you say you have an objective function, typically uh, you can uh, think of one uh, objective, which for example, a structure you want to minimize the, the cost or the weight of the material you use for the structure, but then you have to deal with uh, real physical uh, constraints. So response constraints like stress, displacements, frequency, and then when you have dynamic response uh, in, in uh, noise and vibration, you have way more complex problems. So implement that in a way that you can solve this complex optimization, general multiple constraint optimization efficiently. That's a challenge. And then also dealing with the world is responses efficiently. That's uh, that requires a lot of research by itself. I would say so in the process as we develop the solution, we have uh, uh, developed many methods that we didn't write uh, papers about to deal with such complex real world problem efficiently. Uh, since we are in a um, seminar talking about noise and vibration, I just want to list part, part of the responses we cover. Uh, that's about NVH, for example, we are on the very basis, we cover natural frequency and we can do mode tracking and, uh, uh, and then uh, then you, you can deal with complex displacement, velocity, and acceleration as your response is uh, to formulate a problem, Lomo velocity, acoustic pressure uh, in the acoustic cavity zone like inside the car, and then if you want to deal with radiated uh, uh, exterior noise, you can use equivalent uh, radiated power, and also in the car MVH, you have a lotion of power flow how you optimize that and you can formulate your own complex response with equations. So, so these are the type of things that like you can use how in this case you can you can optimize uh, your uh, parameters to reduce the uh, the radiated uh, power uh, in the in the in your acoustic pressure uh, response. And uh, another example, this one we I think uh, collaborated with, with Renault is uh, about topology optimization with the engine mount. So this uh, engine and then the engine mount bracket, this part is the topology optimization zone. So it uh, defined uh, durability constraints, constraints on for meter stress and then on the MVH, uh, it applied frequency uh, of the bending modes and, and, uh, and uh, dynamic stiffness. And as you can see that it uh, uh, pr uh, solved the problem and uh, yielded uh, a quite clear topology concept uh, and, and uh, reduced, uh, uh, satisfied with the constraints, but at the same time also reduced the mass. And uh, besides the uh, responses dealing with uh, um, uh, the uh, performance of the structure, often you also deal with manufacturing constraints. So that's one of the constraints we developed about 20 years ago. That's one of the first uh, popular requests from our customers when, uh, uh, around uh, 2000 that people want to have testing constraint uh, uh, in the topology optimization formulation. So imagine you have this uh, C channel, the red part is a fixed and non-designed C channel. You want to define the in infill uh, for a torsional load. So if you don't have testing constraint, you, you, you get a closed box. As engineer, we know that this is uh, the optimal design for a torsional load. And, uh, and uh, before I developed this, uh, uh, mathematical formulation and, and came out with the results here like you define you say the casting would have a, a die sliding upwards and it gets this beautiful pattern 
And uh, after that, you understand that how you transfer the, the, the torsional node because it ha has the pairs of ribs to transfer the torsion, which is very intuitive after you see the result. But before that, I asked many experienced engineers, no one came up with the concept. That, that just shows that topology optimization can really give you solution that's not easily uh, uh, achieved with engineering intuition. And then we basically came up with the mathematical formulation about how you deal with this type of constraint as a geometry constraint and the design variables along the draw direction. Um, and, and then you can achieve that uh, mathematically as the constraint. And uh, at the time we didn't publish how we deal with irregular mesh, but uh, now it's known that irregular mesh is just a mesh. You can use the regular design variables based in your design domain and project those variables in its surroundings. So, so in any case, your variable can still be seen as a regular uh, block in this way uh, as you use projection approach. And we have far more complex manufacturing constraints when we, when we, when we develop the com composite optimization. Here is an example of the, this approach applied to uh, airliner and the door part, uh, how to design composite more efficiently. Basically, we come up with a three phase approach at the first phase, we call it free sizing, uh, which optimizes basically the thickness uh, change of the available fiber orientation at like zero plus minus 45 and 90 degrees. And, uh, and when you have a thickness field, you slice them at different uh, uh, level, different level, then you get the layout of your plies, basically this way you optimize your ply layout and then you can further size the, the given ply shape and then at the end you have to also optimize the stacking sequence so that it satisfies manufacturing constraints. So just to show you how this would be mathematically achieved, basically you have to deal with a lot more besides the performance response like uh, stress, displacement, so on you have to deal with design variables. At every element, you have, say, for example, if you have this four different fiber orientation, you have four thickness variables. And then you have deal to deal with certain constraints, like you constrain the total thickness, which is the, the sum of the four variables. But an important one is you want to control the percentage contribution of each fiber so that uh, direction so that it doesn't drop out that would allow you enough combination for the stacking sequence optimization. That's a very important one, but you have this constraints at every element and your, your optimization problem is very complex. And then we developed the ways to deal with this uh, many constraints, but fortunately they are limited with design variables in each constraint and also they are explicit. So, so we find ways to treat them and another constraint is that you want to manage more smooth transition called so called drop rate. So blended, you want to produce blended laminate. So, so you want to control the rate of variables to drop uh, within a certain distance that you can also implement into the optimization problem. And then as we started to, to deal with the manufacturing factoring constraint from, uh, from uh, additive manufacturing, people want to have uh, support free structure and that way you can also formulate constraint for uh, the overhang to, to so that that's uh, the early paper from Gano and Guest using projection method to deal with overhang constraint as you can see in a normal topology you have the result having this downward facing uh, features need support and then at the bottom with this constraint you get a structure that that doesn't need support. And we also implemented this method, Gano guest method. Uh, and then we also introduced another penalty method. We think that uh, it's uh, uh, more meaningful to not completely eliminate overhang, but put it as a, a cost, as a penalty to reduce the amount of support you need because it competes with your performance. So that way you don't sacrifice as much 
performance. So those are all available in OptiZog. So, so with all the examples, there are way more. With all the examples, I just want to make the, uh, the, the, the picture that when you want to provide a practical software, you need to deal with a lot more complex problems. And that by itself involves also a lot of research activity in the process. And uh, here, I just want to show one example. That's used in product. produce it. bracket of the moving roof. So it's uh, it's one of a uh, very nice example of uh, real application. Many auto OEMs have been studying um, uh, additive manufacturing, but uh, that's one of the early examples of real application. So I want to quickly cover a few other aspects. I'm running out of time. So one is the, is a bottleneck in the process is how to convert the concept into geometry and that is time consuming so so we have been doing working on this for a long time and more recently i think we had a more better breakthrough with the automatic polymer fitting of the uh, the parts and uh, and and now you can compare like you typically the left is your uh, topology output and the same uh, here with the polymer fitting now you have a prototype like uh, part that uh, you can, if you 3D print it, you can you can right right away uh, print it and test it. So, and uh, uh, matter physics is another trend uh, that 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 we we need to consider uh, in the design environment. And here is an example of how we uh, developed the uh, convection cooling problem. Uh, that you we implement the Darcy flow uh, in the code and to 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 simulate the the flow cooling flow uh, fluid flow and then uh, optimize uh, the topology of the flow channels and uh, and this is a simple example you have a heated zone and then you have a inflow and outflow and you can say that you can achieve uh, a topology layout for the cooling channel design uh, for key different member size, you get different, most larger member size, you get a uh, simpler solution. And also you say the flow property Reynolds number also affects the results somewhat. And here is a, a 3D example of, uh, of this uh, cooling problem. And uh, uh, another example I want to mention is there was a recent device. So, so recently we added a free shape, a new free shape uh, optimization formulation where you are now a large design freedom. Every grid to move on a shell structure with 3D surface, and then but you smooth the uh, shape with the filtering, similar to actually the filtering used in topology optimization. As you can see in this example, uh, uh, clamped on this end and uh, shell pushing this in this way, you get a beautiful. Uh, pattern of shape that made it way stiffer than the initial design. And uh, what I want to mention is that now we worked with the Flux team, so our e-motor um, uh, software. Uh, so for the uh, electromagnetic simulation, we worked with them to uh, basically combine object with uh, uh, e-motor with Flux to design uh, magnet. Uh, in the motor. So here, uh, this is the e-motor environment, so you can uh, go through easily to define the boundaries you want to define as free shape boundary, and this way uh, you optimize the, the shape of the magnets to improve your flux of the uh, uh, performance. And uh, this results, uh, left is the starting design and the right is the uh, uh, optimized shape of the um, topology. So this is uh, being released, uh, I think, uh, uh, just recently in the 2021.2 uh, release, I believe. So to sum up, 
So what, what has been uh, the trend in terms of optimization technology? And uh, so I would say innovation drives applications. So that's topology optimization came along. It's an innovative technology. So it, uh, it caught engineers uh, attention and they started to drive uh, uh, the application. Before that, there were size and chip optimization on the market, but people didn't pay too much attention. Uh, but but then topology uh, really started to to drive uh, the awareness and then um, new material like one new manufacturing approach composites additive manufacturing also drives uh, um, uh, the more broad awareness and uh, recently with AI machine learning I think it will play important role in terms of transforming technology into software uh, for broad application you need to bring concept close to reality, meaning, like I said, you want to cover a real engineering problem, not just a simplified problem de dealt with in research papers mostly. And then you need to consider also other constraints like manufacturing constraints uh, and, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, in order to make it even more easy to use, you want to integrate solution into industrial verticals. That, that, that's something we we need to do more in the future. And then uh, multidisciplinary, including multi-physics, is, 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 uh, there's a lot more to do, and, but we are taking steps towards that. And uh, design interpretation, create, create uh, geometry, create a prototype that uh, is a bottleneck. I think uh, we have made progress and there is still more work to do. And, and deliver the solution with an easy to use the environment. That's something Tom will cover uh, after my talk. So, so um, to follow on from uh, Ming's talk, which covered uh, a lot of the technology, some of the theory, I'm going to talk more from a um, engineering perspective in terms of how we take this technology and how we enable engineers who don't necessarily have any engineer any optimization experience to to actually uh, utilize these technologies so um, to start with um, I very much doubt uh, anyone here has heard of me before so I will I will unlike Ming so I'll do some some introductions so my name is Tom Goodwin I am one of the engineering managers uh, here at uh, Altair UK, our UK office. Um, outside of my engineering degree, I have no experience of academia really, but I do have 19 years experience of applying optimization technology to deliver real world engineering solutions to the uh, automotive, aerospace and, uh, and marine industries. And, and you can see some you can see some examples on here. I just realized my camera is not on. Let me put that on so you can actually see my face. That's a bit better, isn't it? Um, so I've worked uh, across a, a wide range of industries uh, trying to apply this optimization technology. Um, so my my talk, as I mentioned, is going to cover how we at Alter act to enable everyday engineers to access and use optimization technology that has obviously had its origins at some point in academia. And we like to call this democratization. And I've, I've provided a dictionary reference of what that means. And, and it is the act of making something accessible for everyone. Now that's, that's really important because doing this, democratizing the technology ensures wide adoption of the technology without insisting everyone has all of the academic background uh, to be able to necessarily fully understand that technology. And this, of course, means that the technology can result in very wide adoption um, and it can have the maximum impact on the engineered world around us. And that's, of course, what we're all after, isn't it? We want to design better products, better structures that are better for us better for the environment. And so if we can take this technology, we can democratize it and enable uh, the people that are responsible for creating these products and structures to use it, 
then that's a that's a, a really good a really good thing. So the first area I want to explore is how an engineer perceives optimization technology. And and one way to do this is to look at what they what you know what an engineer wants to spend their time on and what they don't want to spend their time on in the context of optimization. And an engineer, of course, will want to spend the time working on the things that their success is going to be measured by, right? So I've got some examples on the slide here. So they're going to be concerned with meeting the performance targets of their product, improving its efficiency, improving its manufacturability, reducing its cost, improving its quality. And of course, optimization can help the engineer achieve all of these things. But in using the optimization, what they don't want to be spending their time on is thinking about um, the details of the optimization too much. So they don't want to concern themselves with what's the right optimization algorithm to use. If they're going to use some kind of model approximation to do their optimizations on, they don't want to be considering too much the DOE type that they want to run or the approximation method they use for that. And indeed, whilst they will want to use optimization technology to help them, they don't want to spend ages setting up their optimization problems and struggling and having to spend a lot of time interpreting the results. Technology here is here to, to help them. And engineers these days are under extreme pressure to deliver innovation. Not only do they need to be innovative, but they need to be innovative in less time as well. And so any optimization technology that comes along really has to be um, very efficient in, in the way it can help the engineer. The, the engineer, as a result, they don't really care about what a lot of people call optimization land. They don't want to go there. Um, what they want is a optimization technology that is going to save them time without them having to invest too much time in it. So with those previous thoughts in mind, what do we then need to do to make optimization technology accessible to engineers? So the technology, like, like the type of technology that Ming had spoken about in his previous lecture. And there is, in my mind, three key areas. And the top one is really obvious, right? Make it easy to use. And I could just write that on the slide, and that would probably cover everything. If you make it easy to use, people are going to start using it. There's a bit more nuance than that, really. And, and one particular thing I like is um, that optimization technology and the software that uses it must it must only ask questions that the engineer can answer there's no use um, there's no use asking questions of the engineer that relate to some kind of theoretical understanding that they simply do not have so that's really important and then once you've done your optimization you need to make sure that the end result, you can actually use it. So there's a lot of optimization technology that can produce really interesting outcomes from an academic perspective. But if they don't produce something that is of relevance in the real world, then engineers aren't going to use it. They'll get frustrated with it. They'll bin it. They'll go back to whatever traditional method they were using uh, originally. So what I'm going to do with <clears throat> my talk is explore these three different areas and how Altair software is addressing these topics along with some, some examples as well. So we'll start with the topic of, of ease of use, the first topic. So uh, traditionally, um, optimization technology has been enabled for use by engineers that are skilled in computer engineering. So engineers that have some understanding of um, numerical methods and computational methods and applying them to their engineering design. And this, this first example I want to show, this is a video I'm going to show, um, showcases um, one of our pieces of software called Inspire. 
And this, this is an example of where we take optimization technology and we take it beyond even the CAE engineer and we place it into the hands of people that are spend their days working with CAD software to come up with designs. Um, and they rarely get involved. They rarely get involved in CAE, FEA, for example, let alone optimization and how we enable that. So um, I'll just get the video playing now. So this this uh, this shows a, a wing structure. Inside the wing structure, we have a an actuator bracket, and the and the engineer wants to first of all understand the baseline performance of this bracket, so they can very easily in an environment they're familiar with, the CAD environment, introduce loads into the structure. They can analyze the performance. They don't necessarily need to understand the details of the finite element analysis that's going on behind the scenes, and they can get a, an understanding of the stresses, deflections, um, uh, modal frequencies of natural frequencies of the structure and get a feel for that. And once they've got a feel for that design, they may then be interested in trying to understand what the um, optimum design might be. So what's my minimum mass solution in order to maintain the same performance as my baseline? So as noted on the slide here, in this particular example, the engineer may want to find a new concept that is in this case feasible for additive manufacturing, for example. They want to maintain performance. They know what their baseline performance is. They want to maintain that, but they want to save weight at the same time. After all, this is an aerospace structure, and if they can save weight, then that's that's going to be really good for them. So within, within Inspire, you can very easily set up your package space. A designer will understand the concept of package space. The zone within the structure within which your design must reside. So they understand that idea. That's a question you can ask them. What's your package space? Well, they're not shown particularly clearly on this uh, on this video here. I'll come on to that a, a bit later. Alter Inspire also asks very simple questions of the designer in terms of setting up their optimization problem. What do you want to minimize or maximize? What do you want to maintain? What do you want to constrain? And it asks those very simple questions and then it produces some different solutions which the engineer can then inspect visually in an environment they're familiar with, that CAD environment, and then they can make their choices as to which one they want to pursue. And once they've decided which one they want to pursue, we then have technology, as Ming already alluded to, that enables them to take that design and very quickly build um, a polymer based CAD structure over the top of it, uh, fine tune that geometry. After all, these people are designers. This is the environment they're familiar with, the CAD environment, and then check the performance of that design. And they can go through all of this without really having to think about optimization as such. They don't really need to care about the algorithm that's taking place in the background. And you have the usual sort of headline grabbing uh, numbers at the at the end of this with increased stiffness and uh, decreased weight. So this is this is an example of where we've taken the optimization technology to the extreme and, and taken it all the way to the to the design engineer, the person that is used to using CAD. So the next one I want to show, I'll go to the next slide. Here we go. Um, there's a lot of talk of topology optimization uh, so far, but of course, optimization isn't always just about topology optimization. Um, in the in the area of vehicle body engineering, for example, then there's a lot of interest in trying to lightweight those structures by optimizing the thicknesses of the sheet metal panels or castings or extrusions that make up those, those structures. And the video I'm going to show now is, is an example of a, uh, a software tool we've, we have developed called um, the Al Altair MDO Director. 
MDO standing for multidisciplinary optimization. And um, this is a MDO tool targeted specifically towards the design of vehicle body structures. And it enables the engineer to bring in the uh, different models. They have different FE models they have for their different disciplines. For example, their model representing NVH, the models they use for vehicle safety, models they use for durability. And also we sort of break through the multi-physics a little bit and allow the introduction of ride and handling models as well. And the idea is that this tool will enable the user to set up um, thickness design variables on the various parts of the structure and also set up design variables on the on the bush stiffnesses as well and then um, be able to uh, define a multidisciplinary optimization problem which then they can then go on and solve so the software uses a another Altair product called uh, HyperStudy in the background that manages the uh, response surface based optimization that is uh, used or can be used if you want um, for these these types of studies. Now the reason I'm showing you this is because um, the most difficult and time consuming thing to set up in not just MDO problems but really with problems like vehicle bodies is that you have a large number of design variables each perhaps wanting slightly different design variable bounds and you also have a very large number of responses as well that you're interested in especially in a multidisciplinary optimization problem and so the, the main objective of this software is to make mdo setup easy to do which is the subject of this part of the talk it's not only making it easier, it's making it faster and it's making it less prone to error. And it's also centering the setup on something the engineer understands best, their, their model, the model, the design of, their, of their, their vehicle as it stands, their vehicle body as it stands. And it's all centered around, it's all centered around that. And making it, making the setup of these optimizations faster and more importantly, less prone to error means that the solutions you get for them can be obtained more quickly, which means they have more relevance to the design cycle. So instead of spending months and months and months and months doing an, an MDO problem, if you spent that long and you came out at the end of it with a solution, then it's too late. The design has moved on. People have left you behind. You need to have technology that can act quickly to provide design direction. It may not provide the solution, but it can, can provide you with insight that will help point you in the right direction. So I'll set this, I'll set this video uh, going. What we're seeing <clears throat> in this video is um, we have four models on the screen. We have our uh, NVH model on the top left, and we have our um, uh, three uh, vehicle safety models in here. And the tool enables us to bring in these models and automatically link these models together. We scan the models for geometric properties. So these models can have different naming and numbering, different meshes, completely different solvers. It doesn't matter, we can bring them into this tool and we can, we can say, right, this floor pan in this model is the same as this floor pan in that model. And that is done automatically for us. And then we can manually intervene as well to define relationships between components across the models, uh, which is what's being done uh, on the screen here. So we can link these components across our models and we can also link them within our models as well. So you can have symmetrical uh, conditions set up there as well. And th the whole purpose of linking the models in this way is that ultimately we're going to set up design variables on these components and we want that design variable to act on all of our models simultaneously and so we have some visualization options here to help us understand whether we've linked our models correctly whether there's any uh, discrepancies between the uh, components and indeed a, a software tool like this 
even if you're not doing any optimization, is actually quite useful for just uh, identifying uh, differences between your models. So we then move on to the environment in which the uh, engineer can set up their design variables. And again, you know, we're asking simple questions. What components do you want to set a design variable up on? How do you want that design variable to vary? Do you want it to vary as a percentage? Do you want it to be absolute upper and lower bounds? And we can pick the models which we want to create our design variables on. We can import lists of components which we may have predetermined, which we want to put our design variables uh, onto. And we can automatically select those components, go ahead and create the design variables uh, we have uh, selected there. And so I think the video speeds up a little bit after this. We sort of rattle through the creation of the uh, the design variables for the other discipline models that we have uh, in our session here. And you'll notice at the end that we have um, not the same set of design variables across our disciplines. We have um, some commonality, of course, but we don't have exactly the same design variables across all of them. And I'll, I'll talk about um, why uh, that's a good idea uh, later on and how that helps the engineer uh, later on. But what, what I wanted to show you here is the, the sort of ease at which these things can be can be set up using this uh, software technology. Um, so the next part of this video shows um, again how we capitalize on the fact that we've we're working with the model to help us validate our setup so we can have a nice color coded table of all of our design variables we can cycle through each of those design variables in turn and we can isolate on screen the components within each of our models that are associated with those design variables and so instead of just having the table which frankly would be impossible to work with because the naming conventions on these parts are never very useful anyway you have the table and you have the model and so you can you can very easily verify that your setup is okay and therefore eliminate any error in your definition so the next the next thing we make easy to do is not just the design variable setup but also the response definition as well so we've uh, implemented a, a a method where the user has to they have to spend a little bit of time at the beginning to define a response template which is what we see in front of us here and it's simply a group of tables for each discipline that list out all of the load cases that relate to that particular discipline the models that you need to run in order to get the results for those load cases what all the responses are that you want to measure and what your targets are for those responses i.e what your constraints are and then we also point to whatever script or post-processing uh, tool you're going to use to extract these responses and so all of that information is contained in one file and once you've set it up once you can then recycle it time and time again and as a user once you've set it up all you need to do is import that into the uh, into the MDO director and it will automatically set up all of your responses for you, your constraints, you can define your objective in there as well. So that's another example of, of uh, ease of use. Um, the next one I want to move on to is, is that one I liked the best, which was the asking the right questions or making sure you don't ask the wrong questions. So referring back to what the engineer does not want to spend time on reveals the type of questions that we should not be asking the engineer. Things like, as we mentioned before, what optimization algorithm you want to use? Do you want to use a response surface approach? If you do, what design of experience method do you want to use? What approximation method do you want to use? Do you want the optimization to explore locally or globally? There's many more questions. And if an engineer doesn't understand optimization theory or methods, they can't answer these questions. And indeed, if you do ask them, you can get the engineer into trouble because they're, they're going to probably pick the wrong thing or something that's inappropriate. And so 
what you're better off doing is um, asking questions that they can't answer. At the end of the day, you still need answers to these sorts of questions. You need to decide how you're going to formulate your problem. But you're better off trying to get those answers through asking the types of questions that an engineer can understand. So they, they know what their objective is. What do they want to achieve? They know what their targets are. They know how their design is going to be constrained. They know what features of the design they want to vary. And they know what type of simulation that they're running as well. Is it some linear static analysis of some bracket or is it a full blown vehicle safety, nonlinear explicit run, for example? They know how long their simulations take to run and they know what compute resource they have available. And they also know how long they can afford to wait for results. And you can take answers to these questions and help point the engineer in the right direction. Um, so for example, if they are doing vehicle safety analysis using these computationally intensive um, crash simulations, then asking questions like how long your simulations take to run and what compute resource you have available and indeed how long you can afford to wait for results can help you sort of decide what you can get away with, whether you have enough time to be able to do something that is going to actually produce something meaningful for the engineer or whether you need to sort of say, well, actually, you need a bit more time to do this. So it's it's asking these sort of answerable questions. If we go go back to to Inspire, which was obviously targeted to these design engineers where the analysis is quite simple generally, then we 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 put these questions in a very simple way. We ask them what their objective is. Do you want to maximize stiffness? Do you want to minimize mass? And then we put forward some very simple constraint questions to them. If you're maximizing stiffness, then what do you want your mass to be? What percentage of your package space do you want your mass to be? Do you have any um, frequency constraints, for example, in terms of the the normal mode to the structure? Um, so we ask these these simple these simple questions. So it's limited but relevant and questions that the engineer will understand. So behind behind Inspire, we have Optistruct. That's the solver. That's the optimization solver that's sitting behind uh, Inspire. And the Optistruct solver will will automatically pick the most appropriate optimization algorithm based on the type of optimization that the user chooses to undertake. So the tend to call, fall into two classes of problems. You have your size and shape optimization, which is a, generally speaking, a large number of constraints versus a small number of design variables. And in that case, Optistruct uses the method of feasible directions as the optimization approach for that. Whereas if you have uh, topology and topography optimization, you have a large number of design variables uh, versus constraints and we have what we call this dual two optimizer. Um, I've written here it's based on separable convex approximation. Please don't ask me what that means. I do not know if you wanted to answer that question that would have had to have been addressed to me. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the choice is made for the engineer. They don't have to choose. The choice has been made for them based on the type of problem that they're trying to solve. Um, the, the engineer, of course, may want to run optimizations that involve disciplines beyond those supported by Optistructs. And as we mentioned with our uh, MDO director software, so vehicle safety, multi-body multi -body dynamics, CFD. In this case, the engineer can, can utilize our Altair hyperstudy product uh, where response surface based methods are available. And instead of the asking the engineer whether they want to use a response surface based method, um, you can just say that, you know, for certain classes of problem, please use hyperstudy. Um, and the, the response surface based method, as I'm sure all aware, relies on sampling the design space by running some form of DOE, creating a response surface from that DOE finding the optimum, validating it, and then deciding if more sampling is needed to improve the accuracy 
of your uh, of your response surface or uh, converge towards uh, uh, your objective uh, for the optimization and and such uh, methods uh, avoid having to ask the engineers questions they cannot answer and instead the, the problem can be bounded by how much time they have and how much compute resource they have things the engineer can answer very readily so we can we can say how long does your job take to run how much compute resource do you have how much time do you have right in that given those constraints we can do this and at the end of it you will get an answer it may not be the perfect answer you may get a better answer if you would allow more time but it will give you something that you can work with So one one area I wanted to to touch on, which is really important for uh, when it came comes to uh, the, the subject of questions that you ask the engineer, is ensuring computational efficiency. So one of the questions we ask is how much compute resource do you have, and they'll come back with an answer. And of course, whatever they come back with, we need to make sure that we're using that compute resource as efficiently as possible. We're giving them the best in return. Um, for what they've got, and one of the one of the techniques we employ within our multidisciplinary optimization is to uh, introduce methods that rely on the knowledge of the engineer, the engineering knowledge of the engineer, to reduce the number of DOE runs. And so, for example, you may have a body engineering problem where you have 44 design variables on your body, and traditionally you would employ what what we call a full space optimization where each of your disciplines there are four disciplines here all have the same number of design variables uh, applied to them the alternative is to go and speak to the engineer and say well hang on you understand these disciplines you've probably got a fairly good understanding based on your experience as to what parts of this structure are going to have influence on the responses relevant to that discipline and based on the engineering knowledge you can reduce the number of design variables you can say well actually it's only the front of the vehicle that's going to have an impact on front impact on front crash so let's just have the bits at the front likewise for rear side it's just going to be the the middle of the vehicle obviously things like body nvh it's a more global uh problem and so you'll you'll retain perhaps all of your design variables on there but the net effect of applying a bit of engineering knowledge and experience to the problem is that if you for example were to run a, you know quite a modest doe actually four times the number of design variables you can see a significant reduction in the number of uh, vehicle safety crash runs for example versus if you were to employ the full space approach and that that has significant benefits because you're not really impacting on the quality of your um, your optimization problem at the end of the day, um, but you are saving a lot on the computational effort that's involved. So I'm just going to check the time here coming up to half past, aren't we? Um, though, so the final bit I want to talk about in terms of asking the right questions is is the, the topic of design exploration. So in, in some cases, the engineer is they're not just interested in getting an optimum solution, one solution, and that's it. Um, they may be interested in exploring their design. They want to understand, you know, what's what's the relationship between the things I'm varying and the things I'm measuring? I want to understand this. And of course, as we all know, that's best achieved by running a design of experiments. And of course, DOEs are, are good because they can be run entirely in parallel if compute resource allows. If you have a big enough computer, the, your entire DOE could be run in the time it takes to run just one job. Um, that's pretty rare that that would be the case, but it is, you know, theoretically possible at least. And so design exploration can be obtained much faster than, say, running an iterative optimization where it has to go sequentially through its iterations to get to a solution you can run a doe in parallel and you can build your response surface on it and you can then start exploring the relationship uh, between your variables and your responses um, 
and of course, once you've got that response surface, you can you can optimize on that response surface as well. And of course, that's very fast, isn't it? Because you're just operating on a fast running mathematical representation of your of your models. And so providing you've got a good quality response surface, then you can you can not only explore your design, but you can also uh, explore uh, different optimization setups very quickly. Um, very quickly as well. And so the challenge, the challenge really with this is. Um, is how big a DOE should the engineer run in order to get a good quality response surface to give them valuable insights in terms of design exploration and also enable them to run optimizations. And of course, the answer is we, we don't know really, do you? You don't know how big a DOE uh, you need to run. It kind of depends on the problem that you're trying to to address and um, the best that we can offer is to not ask them don't ask them how big it needs to be instead just say what is your problem how much time do you get when do you when do you need some answers they may not be the best answers but when do you need some answers and then set off running a DOE that is extensible. And periodically you then create a response surface on that DOE and feed back to the user some valid information, be it something about design exploration or be it an optimum result. And you just periodically feed that back to the user. And then eventually they'll get to a point where they say, oh, I've got enough information from this, let's stop. But also if they're up against it and they need some information, even if it's not the best quality information, they, they, can, they, can, still, they can still get that. And so we, we enable this in HyperStudy by employing two bits of technology. We have our uh, a, a DOE sampling method called MELS, which is Modified Extensible Lattice Sequences, which is what the illustration on the left of the slide is showing. It will uniformly fill your design space with points. And the good thing about it is that you can run a number of points and then use that in your response surface, but then you can run an additional number of points and they nest in between uniformly the other points in your, in your DOE. And that means every single run is valuable, never wasted. You don't have to run a DOE and think, oh, it's not big enough, I need to start again and run the entire DOE again. You don't need to do that. You can just keep adding and adding and you never waste a run. And the other piece of technology we bring in to, to help the engineer is um, we don't ask them what fitting method um, they want to use. They can choose from if they want, if they're experienced, but we point them in the direction of using uh, what we call our uh, fast technique, which is fits automatically selected by training. And that will, um, and that will uh, automatically pick the most appropriate fitting technique and fitting parameters uh, for each individual response to give the best quality fit and therefore an approximation which will hopefully give the best quality optimization results as well. So on to the, the third and final topic. Um, which is usable results. And this is really, really important. We've, Ming has already touched on the, the idea of, of manufacturing constraints in, in topology optimization. And, and in my opinion, if, if manufacturing constraints had never come along, topology never would have taken off because people never would have been able to realize a solution from it that could actually be transformed into something into something that can be manufactured. And so being able to turn your optimization results into something that you can actually produce in the real world is, is really, really important. And I won't dwell on this too much because Ming has spoken about it already, but we have all these different techniques for emulating the manufacturing technology that we, that we have. Uh, Ming mentioned um, 3D printing. And when 3D printing sort of to started to take off, especially in uh, sort of metal additive manufacturing. A lot of people were thinking, oh, this is great. You know, uh, we can just take these topology optimization results, uh, which were never manufactured in the past, and we can now make them. And 
that that is indeed partially true. You can indeed do that. It's a lot more flexibility with AM. But that doesn't mean to say that there isn't manufacturing constraints. There are still conditions that you have to adhere to, like overhang angles, for example, uh, minimizing support structures uh, in AM. So there are still relevant manufacturing constraints that you need to account for in that. Um, uh, Ming mentioned manufacturing constraints. He didn't mention um, things like uh, symmetry constraints, uh, be a planar symmetry or cyclic symmetry, which is uh, also very useful in uh, achieving a design that suits a certain application like rotating machinery, for example. Again, these are all things which help take that result and turn it into something that can actually be applied in, in reality. Um, I have a quick video which I'll just get playing here. Um, it kind of addresses a, a topic which Ming had covered already, which is the um, the creation, the easy creation of uh, CAD um, following um, a optimization, a topology optimization on some components. In this case, we have a robot arm. They've applied some manufacturing constraints to that robot arm. They're exploring the different solutions. They pick one of their solutions and um, they then evaluate that. Uh, this is all in Inspire. And then they can go ahead and use this um, automatic one click fit polynerbs function, which will wrap that solution in these polynerbs, which they can then go away and tweak and, and form a, a CAD solution. And this is this is really important because um, in order for designs to fly in the in the the engineering world, they need to the, you need to be able to inject them back into the design cycle. And the language of the design cycle is CAD. And if you can't get your result into CAD, you can forget it. Uh, people aren't going to be interested. And so this is really important to be able to do that. OK, so. see where we're getting to here. OK, last couple of slides. So um, the the other topic in terms of having usable results is choosing types of design variables that will yield a solution that again can actually exist in the real world. And there are there's, there's two ways we can do that in our software technology by using discrete and categorical design variables. So discrete design variables, um, uh, you obviously allow the, the design variable to choose from an orderable list, such as a range of discrete thicknesses, for example. As I'm sure you're all aware, trying to discretize a result manually can often end up with the optimum sort of falling off the optimum, especially if it's not very robust optimum as well. And, um, and with categorical design variables, it allows for uh, design variables to choose from a non-orderable list, such as a list of different materials. And this is really quite useful. So, uh, for example, when you are varying material properties on a structure, um, you could just go in and vary continuously the different mechanical properties of the material, the Young's modulus and the density and things like this. But you're highly likely to end up at the end of your optimization problem with some unobtainium, some material which doesn't exist in the real world. And that renders your optimization solution useless. Um, and so you can overcome that by instead of varying the parameters continuously, you can define whole materials as categories which the optimizer can pick from. Um, instead, and that also applies to things like standard sections. If you're doing uh, sort of uh, civil engineering and you want a solution that picks from a set of standard sections in order to keep the cost down, then you can you can employ that uh, you can employ that uh, as well, which again all adds to making these solutions usable. And so this 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 really does sort of close the gap between uh, solution and interpretation, and uh, and adds weight to uh, to to what you can come up with with optimization approaches. So the final uh, final video I want to show here is um, showing results uh, on 
on models. Um, solutions to optimization problems are best displayed, in my opinion, in an environment that the engineer is familiar with. And this is typically the CAE or CAD model that, that they know, the thing that they've designed. And whilst, of course, shape and topology based results can be easily displayed in this way, as we've seen previously, sizing optimization requires sort of different display methods. And what I'm showing on the screen here is some examples of where we can take some gauge optimization results and instead of presenting the user with an unintelligible list of results, we can instead plot the results on the model so they can see the results in context. So they can see things like this, where they can see what, what parts of the structure have increased in thickness and one, what parts have decreased. And one particularly valuable approach you can do here, which I'm showing you, is plot the sensitivities on your model. So you can take that information you've obtained and you can plot on the model those components which are uh, most influential on uh, which uh, which have uh, the most influence on a particular response, for example, and you can um, grade them and categorize them as well. So in this case, we have sort of blue and red components. Red components, um, in this case, if you uh, increase the DV value, you improve the response, and blue parts, if you decrease the value, you'll improve the response. Uh, and uh, and we can show that information on the model. And that's so much more powerful than showing it as a chart or a list in a table, because you can start, to, your brain can start to make connections between what they're seeing, which you just cannot do in tabulated information. And obviously, once it's on a model, you can then very easily start to interrogate results uh, as well without necessarily having to remember what that particular component is called. OK, so. That concludes my talk.